Yeah, it's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Welcome to the Practical Pistol Show. My name is Ben. I'm here to answer shooting questions. Um, angry Matt, Grumpy Matt. Hi. Hi. Um, Jay, you haven't heard it yet, but the new thing that Matt's starting this year. <laughs> oh yeah. You're going to exit out the back door on the stages, not walk back through the stage. So if you bump Matt at a stage, on a stage, when he's trying to walk through, he's going to punch you in the face, he says. <laughs> and that applies to everyone. Yes. It, it, it sounds like that has, that has happened already, huh? No, but it will. No, Matt's, <laughs> Matt's become increasingly angry. All right, today we have Jay Hirschberg, um, who you guys might know from books that we wrote together, and probably... The most important thing Jay's done is completely revolutionize ammo loading. That's fair, right, Jay? Uh, it's a little broad, but no, yeah, okay. it is. <laughs> no, you didn't. You didn't revolution. You uh, it's like there's this car out there that's like a Corvette, and that's pretty cool. And you just built a Ferrari, which is cooler. How about a Tesla? Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess you guys like. Uh, you, everybody likes that Tesla dude, don't they? Elon Musk. He's taking That's over your... the world. He's taking over the world. Okay, yes, I, I can see why you would like Tesla. The Tesla be your car. All right, Tim, we're already live, so don't say anything stupid, please. Um. All right. So, in full disclosure, I have a marketing deal with you, Jay. So, if people think that will color my comments about your your product, that's fine. We also have Matt Hopkins here, who has a Mark 7 and does not have a marketing deal. Correct. Okay. So, Matt, you're going to keep me honest, right? Yeah. All right. Jay, what is Mark 7? What is this thing that is cool that I've wanted to talk to you about for a while, but I wanted to use your machine for a while before we talked about it. We'll go, but tell me, what it, what is this thing for people who do not know? Well, you know, the history behind it is that uh, in 2009, I picked up my hand, a handgun for the first time and kind of moved up through the ranks pretty quickly. And in doing so, you, you realize that getting sponsored ammo is not the best way to go about training and shooting matches. So you start loading your own. And uh, I'm sitting up in my loading room, and I'm surrounded by a bunch of these machines uh, that are out on the market. And I said to myself, there's got to be a better way. There's no process control. It's basically a process that's out of control, right? And you know, given my background, I looked at it and I brought some former colleagues in, and I said, "Hey, let's uh, let's find a way to do this different." Well, and wasn't there a time in your life, Jay, where you weren't loading your own ammo? And yes, I, there I, I, I think you said, "Yeah, that's not going to happen." It's a, a, a Jay <laughs> quote that I recall. Because you're like, "Yeah, I shoot 100,000 rounds a year." I'm like, "Well, why don't you load it?" You're like, "That's not going to happen." Well, right? you know, you know, I, the first time I realized I had to pick up uh, brass off the ground. Was was an awakening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, re reloading is like a necessity, right? Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, I wish it wasn't, but there's really no way that anybody can get around it. And it's not something that I think most people want to do at length, right? I don't want to do it at all, personally. I find it incredibly boring and tedious. This whole yeah. Oh, okay, so. What what were you what were you using to load initially? Uh, well, it's all it's all around Dylan equipment, right? And uh, so you have the, the the entry level product is a Pontus Warren, which is a uh, sort of a mechanically driven arm, articulated so, arm. So you went into an auto like an auto drive 1050 right off the bat. Yeah. So you I was didn't just look around at all. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, uh, and that was the sort of state of the art for a couple of years, and then uh, the first chain drive, auto drive came out, of which I bought two, and I was all excited about that, um, and that, you know, I still have that, that works great, and then uh, I was looking for something a little different, and like I said, trying to not do this necessarily mechanically, but use computers to control what's coming out of the machine. And that took a, that took a lot of doing because the the 1050 is not a product that lends itself well to automation, as you know. Um, well, I suppose not because um, loading y you kind of learn the feel of the press, you know, and you learn what's going to go wrong. Like if the brass that's getting resized and deprimed isn't where it's supposed to be, something will happen and you'll feel it. And you you know, 
if there's a bullet that flips sideways and it's not going to get seated, that you'll feel that, and it all feels a little bit different. You learn the feel of the press. Yeah. Exactly. So there's that tactile piece, right? That feeling that you just mentioned, and then there's yeah. obviously uh, the fact that I don't think that the, the Dylan products were designed with the idea of automation in mind when they were patented in the early you know, '80s. Well, I think that they were more like put that in the manual, like this is a do not do. Right. Yeah. Well, the technology wasn't there, I don't think, in the 80s. Like, they had no thought process on that. What do you think, Jay? Is that... I, I think the machine was initially designed to, to, uh, to meet a, an important need in the market, and it's, it's really actually very clever, right? The way the machine has pieces that break if, if something happens without hurting you or the components or other parts of the machine, right? So it's sort of this modular product, regardless yes. of whether you're in 550, 650, 1050. And so that whole line of products is, is very smart, uh, even today. But because of that modularity uh, and, and mechanically driven nature of the machine, it's, it's not something that lends itself well to being automated without something like a powerful computer watching what happens all the time. Yes, that would be nice if we can have a computer replace the person. So that was so that was your thinking. I mean, so what you you had some pitfalls with the other auto drive products, yeah. Well, yeah, I think when when you have a me a mechanical process, right? It, it, it's it's a, it's a clutch driven, you know, traditional slipper clutch process where the tighter you have the bolts locked down, the more force you're going to get on the sizing die, as an example. And yes. The challenge with that, obviously, is, well, what stops the machine in that situation? You know, a Mack truck? It's like, what happens if I get a jam and I'm just going to uh, have to wait until the force on the machine exceeds the level of the clutch, and then the clutch starts to slip and, and so forth. So I was m primarily concerned about that. Well, I've, I can vouch for that. I have a chain auto drive as well, and I've broken and bent some shit in the course of loading with it, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast with the clutch. It's to the point where if I'm loading with that machine, I, I keep my finger on the button all the time now, right? So I'm watching everything that happens, and if anything goes a little bit sideways, it's like, all right, just turn it off, which is still pretty cool, but not as cool as it could be. Yeah, and then the other thing around that was, you know, are we able to invoke the clutch when things happen that we may not be conscious of? happening as it's happening, right? So um, I didn't realize that, hey, you know, I have a, uh, a sideways primer going into into a piece of brass, or I didn't realize that a bullet fell over, and now I, now I had a, a, a bullet without, a, a brass without bullet on it, and it, it just spilled powder all over my, you know, all over yeah. my match ammo or something, right? Um, so, you know, give, given sort of a lot of ad advances that have been made in technology around manufacturing, is there a you know is there a way that we can start thinking about this uh, electronically? Okay, so that was so let me let me get the get this right. You had the chain drives, and you're like, this could be better. And so you're thinking, I'm gonna make this thing for myself, or maybe there's other people that want this because. As you're talking about this, this sounds to me sort of complicated and expensive to engineer. And then it seems, I mean, you're, my thinking is, there, how, how many people are even going to want this thing? Because it's, it's, it's going to be expensive, obviously, right? Well, you know, all of that stuff was not something that we knew of at, at the time. I did know that I had uh, the ability to bring together a world-class team from an engineering standpoint, uh, given where I live and who I know. And let me throw this at them and, you know, give them a little bit of money and see what, what they can come up with in terms of concepts. Yeah. And we have, you know, a number of different uh, iterations that we've gone through before we ended up with what's sort of in the market today. It was like two years, I would guess, yeah? It's, that's what it took us, yeah. Yeah. It was a lot more expensive and uh, involved than I thought it would be. So you're <laughs> like, you like, debuted the first one in... Easy. 1050, add a computer, boom, <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> when did you debut the first one at shot? Was it January of 2013? It was a year ago. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, and what we had at, at SHOT Show was uh, the final prototype before we went to production. Yeah, the, one, the production ones are cooler, are way cooler than the prototype. Yeah, yeah. video on the old ones. Yeah, it and took us a little stop button. Yeah, it, it took us a while to, uh, it took us longer to go from prototype to production than I think we would have liked. Um, but we, we did send out a bunch of machines for testing and all that kind of stuff before we started selling them. But the, the, uh, the response from the initial SHOT Show was, was a little overwhelming. And uh, so we knew we had a great opportunity. So there's a lot of people that want this. I mean, probably a lot of people listening are like, that sounds cool, but it's, it's like too much money for me. But obviously you're, you're, you're kind of, I think, selling them now. More people are looking at it being like, well, it's not, that, it's not crazy money. Maybe it's worth it. I mean, are you seeing some of that? Are you kind of selling it to people? Like, over time, more people see it in action. Like, yeah, this is really worth it. Well, there were a few criteria that we had to think about when we were, you know, really constructing the business model, right? One was, are we going to sell internationally or not? Um, that was kind of a big piece. Another was... Did you, did you end up going international? Yes, a considerable portion of our sales are international. We ship everywhere in the world right now. Why is that a consideration? Is it just the motor type or electronics? Well, why were we concerned about it? Yeah. Uh, because uh, we had some ideas about how big the 1050 market was in the United States as, as a whole and then how, how large the market was outside of, say, North America. Okay. Uh, and we That's wanted to serve, serve both markets. And so we had the source product that allowed us to easily convert um, the machine for different markets, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, which we do, you know, we get, there are commercial loaders all over the world that we support. Okay, uh, so the initial product was a 1050 um, auto drive thing, it's, it, there was no options initially, right? Right, well actually the, 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 the 1050 that was being sold up until this year's SHOT Show included one of the sensors, uh, the primer sense, which is the low, when the, it, it's yeah, a mechanically okay. driven sensor when the, when the primers run out, you have it on your machine. Yes, you, I do. I think you both do. Yeah. Um, and and in response to initial feedback from the market, we've come up with uh, four products now that allow consumers to select what they want. And actually, the price of the machine has gone down. If you want just the machine itself without any sensors, you can now buy that. Before you you couldn't. How much is that? For people listening, they don't know. Uh, I think it's 2600 on our site right now, or 2500 Okay. Not, not insane. Yes, I mean, and, and this has done well for both commercial reloaders and, and consumers, yes? Right, and, and so there's a portion of the sales, you know, that are going to, to, those, to those two markets, and then you further subdivide it to domestic and international. And now with, uh, with the release of our various products at the SHOT Show, we've confirmed what we thought, which is allowing people to self-serve and pick the products and features that they want depending on what market they're in, right? That is typically what people want, yeah. Yeah, uh, one size doesn't fit all. So um, the machine now has the power to support the high end of the commercial market of going up to 2,400 rounds an hour, uh, which is an upgrade. Or if it's a consumer that wants to have more of a bare bones machine, they can still get the 1800 round an hour machine. Well, what setting do people typically load on? I know I run mine at 1500 rounds an hour, and when you say 2400, that sounds like more trouble than it's worth to me. How is the bigger motor? It, it does. Is the machine work differently? Does it can it, can you actually effectively load at that pace or? You know, that, that, spe that speed was requested. It's offered in the market by some of the other machines that are out there. It, is that for, like, running brass or something? Right. It's, it's not practical to load on mass at that speed, my view. Um, some people do it, but it's really designed for brass processing, where okay. you're really running the first two dies in the 1050, which is the, the sizing decapping combination die and the swage die. And then everything else typically is empty on the machine. Okay, well, see, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, and then the other big product you released was the 650 auto drive, yes? 
Right. So we learned a lot about the, the from from introducing the 1050 and from getting feedback from customers, right? Um, which we listen to very intently. And if we hear what something did, o over and over what did they again, say? Um, they would uh, the number of questions that we got from customers that found out about us about the 650. I mean, we would get a lot, enough to tell us that. Uh, a 650 auto drive would be viable. Right. And then yeah. the question became technol. So there is a market for it. And the question, it's a very difficult tech, uh, technological uh, hurdle to overcome to uh, adapt a digital auto drive to the 650 because of the, um, you know, the nuances of that particular model. It's the what was the was the primer seating a big issue? That's it. It's the primer seating and the way that uh, that mechanism works, which is you know piston operated and a little different than the drive shaft in the 1050. Now, and obviously you're satisfied enough with that 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 that's now being it, it's on the market now or it's coming to market. Uh, the final prototype is what we introduced at the shot show, and uh, that machine will be shipping in April as we go from final prototype to uh, production now. Matt, what do you think about that? Would you auto drive your 650? I've probably loaded 100,000 rounds on the 650, and getting towards the end of it, I couldn't really load more than like 300 without it messing something up, you know? Like, obviously the sensors on it would prevent it from continuing to work, right? When something gets messed up? Or, like, how would that be solved? I know, obviously, the machine probably has to get run on, right? Right. So this, the, the sensors that you're talking about certainly help. Um, but here's the thing. All, the, all this stuff that you do with your hand and that tactile feedback, uh, that can be programmed. Uh, you, can, you can program a system, which, which is my background in software, right, that will look for certain things at certain places and in the 650 you know without giving away too much of what we built because it is covered by a patent um, a, a lot of the stuff happens at particular places in the stroke of the 650 which is a little different than the 1050 so um, you just have to kind of look for that stuff and know how to handle those particular events when they come up does that make sense yeah. um, but, but you know let's be clear that the 650 is not the 1050 uh, and it can't operate at the same speed. No, it can't. So there are there are two models, uh, one run running at 800 rounds an hour and then one running at uh, 900 and 1400 rounds an hour. Hmm. And I, that no, 14 is right at the limit of the machine, isn't it? As just the machine could work if it's flawless. Yeah, it depends who you talk to. But you know what? All this talk about rounds per hour as a metric to benchmark uh, loading and auto drives is is frankly irrelevant. Even when it, even when you look at Camdex and Ammo Loader and all these other machines, it's, what, what's really important to us, you guys like uh, that, where we load 120,000 rounds a year for our own use, which is what I do. Uh, I want to know what is my effective yield per every unit of time that I'm putting into this, right? What's the quality of the stuff that's coming out that I can actually take to the range and shoot and not jam my gun, right? Or not not blow a nationals because I had an ammo problem. That's really sort of the main thing. And you, you're never going to be as accurate with your hand as you will be with a computer. Well, I'll tell you something else, Jay. The big thing for me, the thing that's like literally changed my life going to an auto drive press is where it's like my hands can only take so much in a day. I can work out, I can dry fire, I can live fire, uh, and I can load ammo. And all of that stuff is hard on my hands, right, if I'm running a press. You know, it's like my arms, my hands. Like I can, I, Loading 1,000 rounds or 1,500 rounds on a 650 is work. It's a lot of work. That means I can dry fire less or, or, tr or train less that day. But if, the, the, if the, I got a machine doing that for me, then I could, I've found I like, can actually train harder. So you bring up a really good point, which is we're, we're guys that can load if we had the time and, and want to. But what about people that want to and can't because they're disabled or they have a rotator cuff injury? Like Gaston. And, and I, didn't, I, I didn't really know how many people out there are like that until we started 
marketing these products and would get feedback from customers that aren't, you know, some of that feedback's on our website where they just say, I can shoot again because now I have, a, you know, a loading mechanism that I trust, right, because I can't pull the handle. And part of, part of that audience were veterans. And that was particularly touching for me uh, because I'm doing this because I like it, not because I need to. Uh, and, you know, when you talk to a few veterans that are now able to shoot a little bit more uh, and they couldn't because of the disability that they are in serving our country, I said, you know what, we, we, need, we need to do something about that. So we, we, we dug deep in our pockets and said, okay, any veteran that comes up gets 10% off everything, no questions asked, which is a hard thing to do when you're, you know, starting out, right, as a company. But yeah. I, said to the, I said to the other partners in the business, I said, I really don't care. You know, let's let's make a difference. And you know, every day we have orders like that coming in, and it's it's awesome to see. All right, Jay. What else? What where are you going to go from here? So, what's the new stuff? What are you thinking? If you well, can talk about it, I don't know. Yeah, we're we're just getting started. Um, you know, we're learning a lot uh, as people use our machines. One of the one of the things we learned a lot is is, and I'm not a rifle shooter, but one of my partners is. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one of the things we learned, for example, is uh, when you're loading 30 odd six or 308 or 223, sometimes the brass wiggles a little bit in the 1050 before, uh, as the shell plate indexes, just because of the size of the brass. So we we introduced a, a top dwell feature that slows the machine down just for that. Um, and so there's a there's a lot of programming uh, that will be coming out that will make this process sim more simple, smoother, safer. Uh, as, as time goes on. So that'll be programming that you'll see uh, that's available for free on our website for anybody that owns a machine. Right, so the, you think su support like that's going to continue indefinitely? A absolutely, that's just something I want to do because it's fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> ha have you changed the tablets that are coming with them? Yes, we, uh, you know, we sourced the best we could given what we had at the time and now we're working on sourcing uh, another set of tablets. Okay. So they're they're just Goog you know Google Android tablets that are locked to our needs and specifications, right? There's yeah. nothing magical about the tablet itself. Of course not. No. Um, I don't know, Hopkins. You have anything else? I don't really have anything else. I think the like the technical part, like help of it. I think that's been pretty good so far. I've had a couple questions that they've answered right away. Yeah. Um, I didn't put mine together myself. My wife did, and it took her about an hour, apparently. I don't know. I actually had a, a brand new 1050, put it on the Mark 7. I bolted it down one night, then the next night adjusted the dies after work, and then I was reloading. Yeah. So it's super simple to do it. If you already have a 1050, I think it would take probably less than 30 minutes to even set it up. That, that, that's probably what you're hearing, Jay? Yeah, if it takes somebody longer than that, then then there's something wrong somewhere. You know, the um, we have a great relationship with Dylan, oddly enough. And yeah, um, I would think that they wouldn't be into what you're doing. Just you know. Well, yeah, we we do have a good relationship, and um, and one of the reasons for that is that the, the machine works the best if you maintain it the way that Dylan specifies in their manual, and you don't alter it. And lots of times we get, you know, when we when we get calls from people saying that the machine is behaving in a certain way, it's usually because they have some sort of third-party product on it um, or something that's just making the Dylan do things that it wasn't designed for. If if you look at the mechanism, right, it's it's a belt which absorbs vibration, not creates it, and it's the the mechanism is back and forth, which is exactly how your hand moves, right? Yeah. So it doesn't introduce additional wear into the machine. How many rounds have you run through one of these, Jack? One of our one of our first customers is a commercial loader. They're actually involved in early testing, and they have a half dozen of our machines at fifteen thousand rounds a day, and still going every Jesus day. Christ. Um, wow. Yeah, they're loading uh, rifle and and blackout and stuff like that on it. So we we keep in good touch with them because they're our <laughs> our benchmark for long term testing. Uh, I'm on I'm on the machines every day. You know, when when new features come out, we have a whole array of new sensors that are going to hit the market soon, and they all come to me first, and and I get to beat the crap out of them before uh, 
before we decide if if they're ready to go or not, you know. Yeah. Well, very interesting talk, uh, Jay. Uh, I'm wondering if Tim, send me any questions you have or talk. I have no questions. Did you? Was that informative for you, Tim? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a super um, interesting product. Jay doesn't. Jay, Tim, you're, you're, you're not bringing a lot of salesmanship, Jay. Tim, what you questions do you have since you it's don't have fucking one? Awesome. Like, what would put you over the edge, Tim? You already have a 1050. Uh, Tim, you have a 1050. Yeah, What's it take to buy that? Well, I just got a 1050, man. I don't. I'm not rich like you, Hopkins. Um, <laughs> so, so honestly, I mean, price is price is an issue, right? I mean, and this is this is not information that. Jay hasn't heard before, right? So, like, it's by far the the most expensive on the market, right? But it does the most. So, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know. Well, well you know, I, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you something, Tim, just about that. Um, there's another sort of element about this business that people don't see. We're we're doing the best that we can to source product in the United States. Um, our price point would be significantly different at the same margin if we weren't, right? Yeah. And so when I see people at the shot show or you know people come in with volume orders and they want sort of a, a classic deal and discount, I just say, look, you know, right? This is what we're trying to do. Either you buy into the vision of the company and you're okay with that, or um, you know, or you're not. And, and and this product is not right for everybody. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like. Um, not everybody wants to buy 1050, right? Some people are rocking 550s. So I think, um, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think this all draws for everybody, but I see the advantage in it, right? I mean, I see why somebody would want it. It's just a matter of like it is still a significant amount of cash. So pretty much my favorite part about it is taking videos <laughs> of myself loading and sending those to people. Just being yeah, like, I, yeah, I get those pretty often. Awesome. It's pretty annoying. <laughs> I like the that's 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 why I would compare it to a Ferrari. Like, <laughs> it's so awesome. Holy shit. But Ben, when you're when you're done with a loading session, yeah. uh, do, you, do you go off to the range right away sometimes or No man, I, I, I load in volume, man. Yeah. But yes, I do. I I take some and I'll take I've take my ammo this time of year I'm not shooting a lot because it's uh it's cold as shit. So I'll go and test the ammo to make sure that it's working, but I mean I'll stand there for a few hours and load four or five thousand rounds at a crack. And so when, like, you're, when it comes time to shoot, I got ammo. I'm good. And how how do you feel when you're done with that loading session? Um, I don't know. Like I'm <laughs> listening to music the whole time. I feel it's like kind of relaxing actually. It's just kind of the machine's like fur, 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 it's doing its thing. It's like, all right, cool. Like we're getting some work done, I guess, but I don't really feel like I'm working. You know, normally loading is like, oh my god, this is just awful. Like I need to. When it was, uh, lo was loading on a 650, it was like it's actual work. One of the things I found was it's really nice to just run down there, load 300 rounds up in like 10 minutes and be done, and you have <laughs> enough for a night of shooting or whatever. That's super awesome, I think so far. Well, when I, uh, you know, I get on my machines every day, right, and. Um... After I'm done with the loading session, I just have a smile on my face because it it wasn't like you said, Ben. It wasn't a pain. It's not work. You know? And uh, and I got good stuff. I have bins bins of uh, of ammo, and I'm off and running, and I don't have to spend any more time there than I actually absolutely need to. Well, Jay, I will, I will say this. Um, I've loaded on a square deal on a 650, on a chain drive 1050, and now on a Mark 7 1050, and. As I've gone through all of those presses, um, the presses are like not the now the press I'm loading on is the most sophisticated, um, and it's the fastest, and the ammunition is hands down the best. Like I have, if if I make my wife QC it or make one of the kids QC it, um, I'm going to have the fewest problems with this ammo. Hands you know, down. I want to give you a sort of a development story. When we started coming up with the concept, and these are a bunch of uh, you know. Uh, talented engineers, they came up with this notion of a limit switch, right? Which is, if you can see my hands, it's you know switches at the st at each end of the stroke, and when 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 the mechanism hits one switch, it uh, says, okay, now let's go back to the other direction, and let's go back, to, right? So it, it's kind of this fixed way of telling the machine to reverse direction, yeah? Yes. 
and um, there, 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 there are auto drives that use limit switches out there now. And one, one of the things that happened was uh, we sent we sent these uh, machines out for you know rigorous testing to customers that we know would would really beat them up, and they were coming back with complaints that the overall length of the cartridge was changing. And so we didn't really know what to make of that until we did some deep investigation. And one of our engineers realized that the stroke on a 1050 changes over time, uh, which means as the machine wears, uh, the stroke varies. Uh, it can change. And certainly from machine to machine, the stroke varies. Oh, right? that's why you calibrate every time. That the calibration is programming the motor for the stroke on that machine at that moment in time, so you don't get that variability, right? How does how does the computer know that Ben just lubricated his machine differently, or he changed some bushings, or you know made a change that would impact? Now we're not talking about huge changes in the stroke, but for guys like us, when we go from you know one two three five OAL to one three two, that's a big deal. We, we may not we may get a, a round that doesn't feed. Well, you know. it's not a big deal until it is, right? Right. So we had to come up with a whole new way of, of thinking about uh, thinking about the way that this thing works, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Yes, and uh, good. And all, most of these changes are software. Well, uh, we we most, yeah. think about it this way, right? The computer knows exactly where the tool head is at every, you know, very small fraction of time. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that piece of the equation is done. We know that. Now, what can we do with that? You know, what do we need to provide to reloaders so they can capitalize on that piece? And I'll just I'll have to leave you hanging there uh, for some of the future stuff that's coming out. But um, Well, what I'm saying is, so if, if a guy is an early adopter of this machine, they're going to get all the software upgrades anyway. Yeah, it's, it's software upgrades for life, right? I mean, it, it, what, what does it cost us? To you know, keep uh, you know innovators or early adopters uh, of the product happy. So when we came up with the 2400 round upgrade, we 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 gave it to all of our customers at cost before we introduced it to the market, because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. All right. Maybe you can be the Tesla guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we all if we all had his money, that would be good. That would be that would be cool. All right. I, I don't have anything else, Jay. Thank you for coming on. Uh, it's informative. I think it's um, even if it's not a product that everybody's going to buy. I think it's super interesting. <laughs> it's like it's just an interesting concept, and I'm I'm happy that I have one because I think it's cool. I'm happy that Matt has one, and I'm happy that Tim doesn't have one. So that's <laughs> how I feel about it. Hey, Stegger, you don't use that chain drive thing. Just give it to me. You don't even need it. It's I rusting. know, but it's rusting it, in your if face. If I give it to you, then you'll have it, right? <laughs> you can help me fix it when it breaks. Oh shit! I've I have fucked some stuff up on that one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use it for parts. All right, that's nice of you. All right, well, thank you, Jay, for coming on. Uh, do you have a uh, website? What's your website if people want to go and? Uh, yeah, Google? it is it is Mark Seven Reloading, but it's spelled M A R K V I I dash loading dot com. It'll come up on Google if you search Mark Seven Reloading. All right, that's good. Uh, thank you, Matt, and that's it. That's all we have. If you have any shooting questions you'd like answered, uh, go to bensegger.com, email me. We'll answer your questions. And if you have any questions for Jay, go to Mark7 Reloading, and I'm sure he'll answer your questions, or you have some tech support goon or whatever. Or do we get I'm you? very responsive on Facebook. Oh, you have a tech support goon. Uh, yeah, who is very nice. My wife talked to him. And we have a tech support department, yeah. Oh, a head goon. <laughs> team of goons that's the best